Welcome to Mexico, rounds eight and nine, and another new race location for Formula E. Right now we're in Puebla, about two, two and a half hours southeast of Mexico City, in the shadow of a volcano, which is very cool. And this circuit, the Autodromo Miguel E. Abed, has got a lot to offer. It's going to be interesting to see how Formula E adapts to this circuit. We'll get into all of that in a little bit more later, but for now, let's see what we have in store. So first up, let's talk about the contenders going into these races. Now, if we've learned absolutely anything from the season so far, it's that podium positions, the opportunity is there for pretty much most of the grid. The combination of the qualifying format, the chaos that comes with electric racing, and the fact that we're witnessing the most competitive season of Formula E in its history has made it difficult for any one driver or team to consistently perform. Now going into this double header, there's fewer than 20 points between the top seven in the driver's standings. So, which drivers are primed to increase the gap on their rivals? Leading the championship, even without a win to his name so far this season, is Dutchman Robin Freins. Two podiums so far and has shown great pace in his Envision Virgin racing car. Making a number of brash overtakes in that three-way battle for the lead between himself, Mitch Evans and Antonio Felix da Costa. And snatching second from Mitch Evans just metres before the finish line. We got him. P2, mate. P2. Good job. <laughs> If Fryens can maintain his current trend of scoring big when he does score points and avoid a repeat of that brutal ending to his 2018-2019 season, where similarly he led the standings before becoming somewhat of a target for multiple crashes. If he can avoid all of that, he's in for a shot. His first win of the season here, or just another big points haul, that would go a long way towards his title hopes. So last time out in Monaco, Diaz Cicita joined Mercedes EQ in being the only team to have both drivers win a race so far this season. Now, that win for Da Costa massively put an end to his slow start to the campaign and rejuvenated any hopes of a title retention. Let's just picture it this way. Da Costa scored more points in Monaco than he had in the previous six races combined. The performance, patience and flawless strategy shown by him and the team to get that win marks a real turning point for the reigning champ. The team left Monaco with 41 points, aided also by Verne's fourth place and fastest lap, throwing themselves right back into the hunt. We don't know yet how qualifying will play out on this circuit, but if it goes well for the team, there's every chance that they and Da Costa could start to mount a similar attack on the championship as we saw last season. But, and it's a big but, with the grid more competitive than ever and consistency being even harder to achieve, it's not going to be an easy challenge. Mercedes EQ, a season of mixed fortunes, let's say. Three wins, two for Nick De Vries, one for Stoffel Van Dorn, uh, third place and seven zero point finishes. The most recent result being a double DNF. And the same goes for Mercedes powered customer team, Rocket Venturi Racing 2. Fortunately for Mercedes EQ, only seven points separate the top three teams, and the wins and big points hauls have kept them very much in the game. But as we now dive into the second half of the season, consistent point scoring is a fundamental requirement for any title hopes, and there are many still in with a chance. And these next two races need to be the place where teams like Mercedes EQ stake their claim on the championship, push for points and start winning races again. Jaguar Racing started the season with impressive pace and very solid point scoring, thanks to wins and double podiums, 74 points to be exact. But after tailing off and accruing just eight points between the drivers in the three races that followed, and then going from a race lead to scraping a podium in Monaco, they'll be intending to battle hard here to regain that team consistency and get themselves back to the top of both teams and drivers' standings. Two incredibly talented drivers and proven race winners in Mitch Evans and Sam Bird. And with so few points between the top drivers in the standings, it's very much in their hands. Could Mexico be the arena that stages that return to the top step of the podium? Quietly climbing themselves up the tables are Audi Sport app Schaeffler, currently sitting sixth in the team standings, much to the credit of Rene Rast, who scored 39 of the team's 53 points. 
There's no reason why podiums and race wins aren't on the cards for Audi. Despite a few technical problems and a little bit of bad luck, Rene Rast and Lucas Degrassi have made up 81 positions in the previous seven rounds, so the race pace is very much there. A boost in qualifying performance and starting position is all the German manufacturer team needs to get themselves into the mix. Now we've seen the second half of the season resurgence from them before to claim a team's title, so can they do it again? History suggests that Mexico is a successful stomping ground for them, so there's every chance. Right, so time to talk about the circuit that's hosting this weekend's double header, the Autodromo Miguel E. Abed, one of Mexico's premier racing circuits. I guess more commonly known for championships like NASCAR Mexico and the World Touring Car Championships between 2005 and 2009-ish. It's an oval circuit, as you can see here by the way it banks round coming into this start-finish straight, but it does have infield sections with multiple configurations available, the Formula E layout looking a little like this. The infield of this circuit is known for having an infamously rough surface, which you can see here. This sort of falls into the hands of Formula E because it replicates a similar, constantly evolving, tough, changing surfaces like the drivers are used to racing on in the street circuits. And obviously we can't talk about the track without talking about attack mode, where it is, how it's going to work. And in Puebla, that is very interesting because what we're usually used to is a you know, corner like this, turn eight, where attack mode is here. The cars drive in, they go wide, they go round, they lose a few seconds, that's kind of it. Here is very different because attack mode activation is this entire new part of the circuit where you have to drive not just offline, but almost off circuit onto a different surface, come back round and join the track over on the other side. We're talking four, five, six, maybe even more seconds lost here. So using it and the activation of when it's used is going to be so crucial. Strategy is everything. Yes, everybody has to do it uh, multiple times a race, but deciding when it's activated and getting yourself into a position in the laps beforehand to minimize any consequences of all that time you're about to lose is going to be very interesting to see here. And finally, a little bit of driver news. DTM race winner and experienced Formula E test driver, Joel Eriksson, is stepping in for an absent Nico Muller for Dragon Penske Autosport. This is going to be a steep learning curve for a new driver at this point of the season. But the playing field is a little more even given that none of the drivers on the grid have ever raced here before. We're looking forward to seeing how he gets on because with negotiations and driver changes just around the corner, a good performance here could present him with the prospect of a future seat in the championship. So there we go. A little bit to be thinking about ahead of this weekend's double header. We're fresh after the break from Monaco, ready to race. And this weekend's races are looking absolutely primed to be eventful. But what do you think? What are your predictions? Let us know in the comments or by playing the Formula E Predictor app or on the website and head over to fiaformulae.com forward slash watch to find out exactly where you can watch the race where you are. Enjoy.